Welcome to the Latte Lounge podcast. Join me, your host, Katie Taylor, as we talk balancing hormones, busting myths, breaking taboos, boosting libidos, and bolstering confidence. Why not grab a coffee or go for a walk and join us in the Latte Lounge as we chat all things midlife, menopause, and beyond. With thanks to our friends at Silk Natural Lubricant for making this podcast possible. Welcome to a very special episode of the Latte Lounge podcast, all about breast cancer, midlife and menopause. Now, from the very first stages of planning this podcast over a year ago, there was one person I knew I had to interview. Professor Michael Baum is a British surgical oncologist who has dedicated his career to caring for women with breast cancer and was honoured with the St Gallen Lifetime Achievement Award for the treatment of breast cancer in 2007 and the gold medal of the International College of Surgeons. During his career, Professor Baum had a key influence on how breast cancer is now treated and managed, co-developing pioneering treatments, including one that replaces weeks of long treatment with just one shot of radiotherapy in a single 20 to 30 minute hospital visit. He is quite simply an inspiration in the world of women's health. And for regulars of the Latin Lounge, you'll also know that I'm lucky enough to call this wonderful man my dad. And he's part of the reason I created the Latte Lounge too. Now, today we're going to be exploring breast cancer in midlife, just how common it is, looking at the latest treatment options, and how menopausal symptoms can impact recovery. Professor Baum is going to share his vast experience with us and explain how diagnosis and treatment of breast cancer has evolved over the years and just why he's optimistic about the future of breast cancer research. Welcome, Professor Baum, or should I call you Dad? Thank you so much for joining us today. Call me Professor. (laughs) We're very very formal here in our family in the lounge. Right. Um, So listen, for those of you, well, for those of you listening who don't know my father, I thought a good place to start would be to ask you, Professor Baum, um, about your own life in terms of how it how it was touched by breast cancer at a relatively young age. Um, some listeners may know this already, but can you share what happened and how that inspired you to enter this field in medicine? Um, yes, um, I'd always wanted to be a surgeon and. Um, so I qualified in 1960 at Birmingham University and immediately embarked on a uh, program that would lead to the Fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons. And I uh, became FRCS in 1965. And my first consultant appointment was um, in Cardiff. Uh, University Hospital of Wales, a senior lecture uh, consultant. Uh, I was very happy there. Um, But at that time, uh, my mother developed breast cancer. It's to say she developed breast cancer really understates it. She presented with bone metastases. The first thing I knew that she had breast cancer was that she had backache. She was complaining of severe backache. And uh, she'd obviously had the cancer for a long time. And by the time uh, it was obvious, she had uh, bone metastases. Now, uh, going back to those days, the, the treatments were pretty dreadful. She was put on a cocktail of cytotoxic drugs, which frankly, made her worse. She lost her lovely black hair, became bald, and frankly, didn't have enough analgesia. I became, seems uh, irrational, I became angry. Uh, That was the feeling, angry. This is an animal I'm going after. I hate (laughs) breast cancer. I'm going after it. So I decided then, that I would pursue the subject. That was then. Uh, Some years later, my uh, young sister developed breast cancer. In fact, it was precisely 27 years ago. Um, I know that number for for other reasons. And um, she remained 
uh, well, for 25 years, and sadly, two years ago, where she uh, developed secondaries, which tells you something about the disease. It's uh, not easy, very complex. So you can understand that why I feel passionate about the subject. Absolutely. And obviously, I was very young at the time. So my, my memory of that time was limited, but I know how traumatic an experience that must have been for you to watch your own mother um, suffer and, and also suffer with pain. And um, look, women are constantly worried about getting breast cancer. It's, it's the, the number one worry. Um, you know, you often see the pink brigade, you know, raising funds for breast cancer. Uh, women are terrified and, you know, not sure whether they should be checking or, or screening or, or, or how they should sort of change their sort of lifestyle. Um, yeah. and so I thought it would be, you know, really sort of good to sort of ask you about sort of how common is 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 breast cancer now, um, and and I suppose let's look at how sort of treatment has evolved o over the the course of your career from those very early days when you saw yeah. your mum suffer so badly. Yeah, um, there are two ways of looking at that. Uh, one is the success of treatment of breast cancer. Um, it is now relegated to seventh in the league, mostly because the treatment uh, has improved and uh, we look upon uh, breast cancer these days as a curable condition in most cases. Um, so that's one way of looking at it. Um, the other way of looking at it is for women to be more concerned about other diseases. Why obsess about breast cancer? Well, I know why, because uh, it's got a long history. Uh, uh, it's a challenge to the woman's identity, not just the life, but the very identity as a woman is challenged, uh, particularly in the bad old days when the breasts were removed. But these days, they should be women should be worried about dementia. Women should be worried about coronary artery disease, heart attacks, strokes, uh, osteoporosis, which are much more common causes of death from uh, than breast cancer. So it's a double-edged thing. Other things are becoming more co uh, common, uh, whereas breast cancer remains at a fairly constant incidence rate, but the mortality rate is falling. So there's a difference. If the incidence is debatable, it's something like one in 11 or one in eight women will get it. Depends how you find it. But when you look at mortality rates, the deaths from is just dropped, dropped, dropped. And these other things have become more and more important. Yeah, and and we'll we'll go on to um, incidents in in a minute because I know it's an unhelpful metric. Um, but let let's look at the treatment, how that has sort of evolved. You know, you were involved yeah. um, with breakthrough uh, treatments in the very early days of tamoxifen. Yeah. But uh, let's look at that and and what sort of treatment options are now available and how that has therefore impacted survival rates. Right. So. Um... I, when I became a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons in 1965, one of the questions were, how do you treat breast cancer? And that was an easy question because everyone knew how to treat breast cancer. Radical mastectomy, end of story. Next question, please. So in spite of these super hyper uh, radical operations, uh, these women were still, 50% were still dying within five years, having had the disease all taken away, as the surgeon said. It's ridiculous. So we went from there uh, um, over, I mean, it was a battlefield. I was part of, a member of that battlefield against radical surgery. And we now accept with beyond question that in the vast majority of cases, you can uh, tr adequately treat the local disease by removing uh, a lump and treating the rest of the breast with radiotherapy. The radiotherapy can be external beam, 
or internal being. That's another story, intraoperative. But the cosmetic results are really very good. So the women are not mutilated. In addition, there are some cases where there are more than one focus, so multifocal uh, cancers, where the woman inevitably has to have a mastectomy. But the progress in reconstruction has been fantastic. And plastic surgeons can reconstruct it. So when it comes to cosmesis, uh, uh, identity as a woman, that's made fantastic progress. But equally important is the issue of curing the disease. However well you control the local disease, the uh, threat to the woman's life, the distant metastases, secondaries, metastases, secondaries, it's the same thing. They are sitting there asleep. We talk about occult distant metastases. What we mean by that is that they have already disseminated and many of them are just um, sleeping, sleeping uh, threat. Uh, and they can come back uh, to later dates. But if we anticipate that and, and treat patients with medication uh, for the whole body, then we can improve the cure rate. Now, uh, the first treatments were chemotherapy, which were pretty toxic. Uh, but then we introduced endocrine therapy, hormone therapy, and probably the most successful drug in the history of the treatment of breast cancer is tamoxifen. And that's used in most women uh, today, uh, particularly if the cancer has a receptor for hormones, estrogen receptor. The majority of breast cancers do have estrogen receptors and the disease can be uh, controlled or cured by giving women the uh, anti-hormone treatment, um, which include tamoxifen. There. there are other hormonal therapies as well. I won't go into too many details. They are generally well tolerated. Um, and uh, we come on to the side effects and uh, HRT, no doubt, in due, due course. Um, there is also chemotherapy uh, for those women who don't have estrogen receptors, which is much kinder than initially, and the side effects of these uh, cytotoxic drugs can be controlled. And then the, the exciting new developments of endocrine therapy, uh, of uh, immunotherapy, uh, just appearing on the horizon. So the story of the treatment of breast cancer is a success, uh, well, a major success story. So much so uh, the uh, mortality has fallen and women have got other things to worry about, not just breast cancer. Yeah, I mean, it, it must be hard for women who are listening to this and, and myself included, who have perhaps lost good friends from this disease, you know, in, in recent years or even a decade ago, or are suffering from it themselves now. It can be a very scary diagnosis to be given. Um, so what would you say to, to women about it, things like, you know, let's look at things like prevention um, and screening. I know you have very, very strong views, which will surprise a lot of people who haven't come across you yet on screening. But, um, you know, let, let's talk about prevention in terms of... Right. The, yeah. um, prevention, um, the, there are many things women can do to reduce the risk, no, no doubt. Another good news story another good news many many things to reduce the risk um exercise weight loss healthy diets now it just happens that these things that reduce these uh, activities that reduce the incidence of breast cancer are good for everything for reducing the risk of heart disease and hypertension so um, there are healthy lifestyles. Women should 
exercise. Women should control their weight. Women should have my, uh, as many uh, uh, fruit and vegetables as, as they can. They will feel better, they will look better, and they will reduce the risk of uh, uh, breast cancer and other diseases which are more likely to kill them in the, in the long run. So uh, that's simple. <laughs> And, and obviously things like, you know, obvious things like reducing smoking and, and, and alcohol. But, but what about um, screening and uh, breast check, uh, bre you know, breast self-examination? Yeah. Because, um, you know, sorry, uh, smoking, uh, there isn't a strong link with smoking. I mean, smoking is a terrible thing to do. It's got the many cancers, particularly lung cancer, which is important. Drinking in moderation is OK. Uh, but yes, you're right to remind me that uh, too much alcohol, uh, uh, more than a unit a day, uh, can increase the risk. But it also does nice things. <laughs> <laughs> He's just trying to get across that he loves a good whiskey every night. But... I, I love a whiskey, but I'm not at risk. Of you're not at risk. But, but... So... Let's talk about screening. You know, a lot of women will get to their 50th birthday and they'll get that letter in the post, especially here in the UK. Yeah. Um, how, let's talk about screening. Why Why are you... Uh, well, let you, I'll let you speak. <laughs> let me speak for myself. I, I probably know more about mammographic screening than any anyone in the country. That sounds arrogant. The reason is I've lived a long time. I was one of the, uh, I'm 85 years old, and I was one of the architects of the screening program. I opened the first screening unit in 1987. The first screening unit in England, to England in 1987, 1987, 88, I made a huge investment into screening. And I served on the committee for screening for seven years until I realized it did not live up to promise. Um, what we know now, there's a lot between then and now, but what we know now, if we can summarize it in a simple way, for every thousand women uh, screened by mammography, over 10 years will avoid one breast cancer death. Now note, I'm not saying it will uh, make them live longer. They will avoid one breast cancer death at the cost of death from something else. So a, a thousand women, one breast cancer death avoided, traded, by causes of death from other things. And that's mainly because of the overdiagnosis of breast cancer. I'll come back to that at a moment. So I'm, uh, I'm, I think screening for breast cancer has a great future behind it. It was a good idea at the time. It was, uh, it was a, a, a courageous experiment, but when the data changes, you must change your mind. The data now no longer supports mammographic screening. I'm not an heretic. I, I'm, I'm a scientist. I go with the data. But the trouble is screening has become politicized and no uh, government would have the courage to say, well, sorry, guys, or girl, uh, it doesn't live up to its promise. But those letters are being sent um, every single day to women. Um, they're landing on their doorsteps. They go for your screening. Does that information, um, is that information in that leaflet? And, and does anyone actually read it? Because I know, you know, myself included, you just get the letter and, and everyone says, oh, have you had your screening? Oh, no, I must go. Um, and you don't read it. So when women go to that appointment, is that explained to them? Well, we, people like me, had a, a battle, lasted 10 years, of, of giving women information. Um, 
I remember the reason I resigned from the committee was I was describing the data that failed to support the um, uh, the adventure of mammographic screening. And I was told if women knew that, they wouldn't accept the invitation. And I, I asked them to repeat it because I thought I hadn't heard right, that we deny women information that we know because we know better than the women well, goodbye. I resigned and I wrote a letter in the Lancet explaining my fury that they were denying knowledge to the woman that we, we the clinicians, the scientists, knew. And one of those, uh, well, there were two obvious problems. Uh, one was duct carcinoma in situ, which is a condition um, that you only find when you screen. Uh, it's, uh, before screening, we didn't see it. With screening, 20% um, of the quote cancers was something called duct carcinoma in situ, which looked like cancer, but don't, doesn't behave like cancer. And it was a sure, oh good, it's a pre-cancer. So if we find all these duct carcinoma in situs, then the invasive cancers will go away. It's, it wasn't true. It was just adding a 20% additional burden on women without any benefit. And because it was multifocal disease in many, many, many spots multifocal, there were more mastectomies. So screening increased the incidence of mastectomy. And women deserved to know that. So after about 10 years, it was then introduced into the leaflet. Uh, but as you say, the leaflets aren't really read. And hearing that, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? Because you hear, oh, I, I've, I've been diagnosed with DCIS, uh, I've got breast cancer. You immediately then go into panic and anxiety. Um, you behave like a cancer patient. You fear for your life and you probably go through all this unnecessary treatment. And, and when I explain to my friends why when I get my letter, uh, I basically sort of throw it in the bin because I know this, they're, they're pretty shocked to hear that. And they're like, well, well, I'd rather be the one woman that is saved. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm not gonna worry about all the other women that, um, you know, may be over-diagnosed. So uh, they are saying, well, what are you gonna do? You know, well, if you don't have screening, well, how are you going to know? You know, if you find a, a lump, it's too late. Um, maybe you can sort of <laughs> address yeah. that. Um, well, I'm often asked this. If we don't have screening, what what should we do? Well, the, the rude question is, who says you should do anything? Women are living longer now and living healthier now than ever. Who should we, why should we be doing any, anything? So. What, uh, what I say now is live a healthy lifestyle and should you become aware of any, any abnormality in the breast that you'll notice a dimple, you're um, showering and you notice a lump, you report it. But you don't do ritualistic self-examination. I've never seen a patient with breast cancer found by ritualistic. No, I, I was practicing as a specialist for 30 years. I never saw one woman and said, I was doing my monthly check and I found the lump. Uh, it's mythical. And actually, that advice is actually finally filtering through because, for example, my own gynecologist was doing breast checks when I was going for my um, HRT checkups up until about a few months ago where he said, I now don't have to do this anymore. So, um, you know, it, it, that, that information is filtering through. Um, is there any space where screening is advisable? So what about um, high risk women where, where there's perhaps a a high family incidence. Yeah, that, that's a good question. And it's a question we are debating at the moment. And we, you know, um, um, my profession are debating. Uh, how do you manage someone with a BRCA1, BRCA2 um, 
mutation which makes the family at high risk of developing breast cancer. Um, well, uh, first of all, if you are worried that you've got a bad family history, then you should go and see uh, a, guy, um, a geneticist to see if you've got this. Um, there's a lot of breast cancer in my family, but we've tested negative. We don't have the mutation. Um, but if you do have the mutation, if you carry the mutation, you've got a very high risk of developing breast cancer to relatively early age. So the standard of care uh, is prophylactic mastectomy. That's protective in removing the breast. So it's, it's a pretty terrible thing to do, but it's somehow a little bit uh, easier to offer because you can have reconstruction, uh, which is pretty good. The, the plastic surgeons are really, really good these days. Uh, that's the standard of care. The alternative is to have a uh, screening with uh, MRI. MRI is more sensitive than conventional uh, X-rays. So I think a woman should have a choice. It's a question of pros and cons, get it over and done with, uh, have you a prophylactic mastectomy and reconstruction, or say have annual MRI scans. Again, the choice is the woman, the woman's choice. There are pros and cons, and the, the women should be given all the information that is there and then be allowed to make the choice. Yeah. Um, now, this obviously is a menopause and midlife podcast, and I do want to come on in a couple of minutes to talk about um, menopause and breast cancer. But before I do, one thing um, that I did want to ask you is that this whole catch it early, save a life, save a breast mantra. Um, I think a lot of uh, people, um, and, and understandably so, think that, um, you know, cancer starts here and then it will go, you know, in a linear um, fashion until it's, yeah. it's bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and you talk about DCIS, DCIS um, supposed cancers that actually were never programmed to go anywhere and certainly not to kill you. So can we just talk about that? You know, do you find a lump and then is it going to stay there for 10 years and not do any harm or will it just grow each year until yeah too late? um that's um a very good question and, and uh, much of my research has been based upon what we call mathematical models um now the easiest way of explaining it is lesson one to my medical students. I have my medical students for the first time, and I ask them, if you uh, come across uh, a tumor in your breast, which is uh, one centimeter diameter, you find that in your breast, and if it's been there six years or six months, which would you prefer? Because it's been there six years or six months or six weeks, and they think, and they're clever. I'd rather if it had been there six years, yeah. So when we talk about early diagnosis, it is meaningless. It's a meaningless mantra. What you're saying is early is small. Well, small may be bad, small may be good. Um, the most important thing about the cancer uh, is its aggressiveness. Does it appear very quickly and progress? And this is one of the reasons why, another reason why screening doesn't work. Screening is uh, one, three years apart. Now, when the cancers we pick up at screening are the good ones because they hang around for three years. The cancers we don't pick up at screening, it's about the middle. They're the fast growing cancer. So that's the other fallacy about screening. The bad cancers aren't going to hang around to be found. And the good ones will be wait it, wait. Now, amongst those that are good, 
very good because they're never going to threaten your life in the first place. You've got the 20% of cases that you find that don't cast them in situ. They're no threat to you, but you don't know that. So you end up having a mastectomy, which is heartbreaking. So uh, what do you, how do you explain this is um, cancer doesn't behave like that. That's a myth. Um, it's an assumption that it's a linear, we call it a linear uh, model. Cancer is a chaotic model and chaos, what's chaos theory? The weather is chaos theory. Um, little clouds, don't become big clouds. Rainstorms come out the blue. So we're pretty good at uh, uh, the weather forecasting because we got the maths right. The maths is nonlinear chaos. And I think one of the most important revolutions in our understanding of breast cancer is it is not a linear issue, it's a chaotic issue. I, and I like that cloud analogy. Uh, and at the end of this podcast, um, I actually want to touch back on that in terms of the future. But let's turn to menopause and breast cancer. Now, there's a lot of concern, um, quite understandably, again, in the breast cancer community for those that have either got breast cancer or have had it, um, who have suffered terribly um, with menopausal symptoms. Now, whether that's um, they were... Um, d um, through surgical menopause or through chemical menopause. And um, they've a lot of women are advised that they can't go on uh, hormone replacement therapy um, because it's going to um, increase their risk of recurrence. Um, or, or for women who haven't had breast cancer, um, they've been told that HRT causes breast cancer. So, you know, we've talked um, on um, some of the earlier episodes of this podcast about this, but for those that perhaps um, didn't hear that, can you explain where this fear has come from, where it stemmed from? It's this cliche, uh, estrogens cause breast cancer. Estrogens cause breast cancer. It's been said so often people believe it. Well, it's not true. Estrogens do not cause breast cancer. If estrogens cause breast cancer, then you get breast cancer at a young age when the estrogens are up here. You wouldn't get breast cancer in old age where the estrogens are down there. So that's the first thing. The other thing, if you happen to get breast cancer when you're pregnant and your estrogens are up the, the ceiling level, those cancers do rather well. They don't do bad. That's second. The next thing, before tamoxifen came along uh, and we were uh, facing a woman with an advanced breast cancer, we would give them estrogens. It would reduce the size of the tumour. And then uh, in the, um, the biggest clinical trial, randomized clinical trial of HRT versus no HRT, in the long-term follow-up, those women who had estrogen replacement therapy, because they'd had a hysterectomy, had a lower incidence of uh, breast cancer. So uh, estrogens can protect you against breast cancer. They don't cause breast cancer. Um, and it's difficult to understand uh, where that came from in the first place. Well, obviously, you I mean, you know yourself and uh, we mentioned it at the beginning, so um, I haven't sort of pushed it out there too much with you. But the Women's Health Initiative trial and then the follow up trial, which you were obviously allu alluding to, um, what, what caused a huge, well, a massive disservice uh, to women who were terrified and, and this um trial you know were, was basically alluding to the fact that it did cause breast cancer and doctors and women were hysterical and immediately came off it um and so we've had 20 years or, or more where women have suffered unnecessarily and it's interesting because this follow-up trial you know there's no big press release out there saying oh sorry we yeah. got it wrong <laughs> 
good news isn't published. <laughs> so the Women's Health Initiative, I think the first publication was 2002. It was so flawed in retrospect, it shouldn't have been published. The long-term follow-up, when the data were mature, published, was it 2015, I think? Yeah. I think yeah, 2015, like reverse the findings and, and said uh, show that if it's estrogen alone, reduces the risk of breast cancer. Now, you obviously looked after a lot of women um, who, who were recovering from breast cancer. So you would have seen yourself how that recovery was impacted by uh, menopausal symptoms and, and obviously vice versa. So, you know, in the aftercare that you and your teams would provide, what sort of treatment options would be offered to women who were struggling with menopausal symptoms? Um. Then you, you go back to first principles. I, I was telling you about the lesson one for my medical students. Um, well, that actually wasn't lesson one. That was lesson one breast cancer. But lesson one surgery was number one, why do we practice medicine? Why do we practice medicine? You think that's an easy question to answer. Well, it is, but the students make it difficult. We practice medicine to improve length of life and quality of life. And when it comes to quality of life, you can measure it. There are psychometric instruments for measuring quality of life. So everything that we do in medicine is a balance between um, if we're dealing with serious diseases now and everything we do is a balance between length of life and quality of life. Uh, ideally, the, the treatments that improve length of life, it would be nice if they also improve uh, quality of life. Now, um, women who are suddenly become, uh, lose uh, their ovarian function, I, I like to talk about estrogen depletion disorder rather than menopause. I'm not sure. Menopause doesn't actually say anything. Uh, but estrogen depletion, uh, we know what that means. And that can happen naturally, or it can happen when a woman's ovaries are removed, estrogen depletion therapy. And it's a serious attack on the women many women suffer from. I get cross with a, a Twitter. What really pisses me off on Twitter is some self-appointed authority. I sail through the menopause. Nothing. You. What's the matter with you? I really get cross. Well, okay, you got lovely. You sail through it. The majority of women uh, suffer from it. And, it. and it's not just hot flushes. It's depression. It's fogging of the brain. And, uh, and then there's the long-term consequences. So I think we should always consider hormone replacement therapy for women who are suffering uh, whatever the reason, you, you've got issue and depletion problem, you give them hormones. So my default position was always give uh, allow women HRT, unless there's some specific knowledge that that will do her harm. And women are really suffering from HRT. I'm not sure where the data are that it's dangerous. I mean, uh, if any of you have been, <laughs> if any of you watching uh, this or if, if Katie, if you come across a paper which makes it absolutely clear that it's dangerous to give HRT, I'm, I'll accept the, the, the knowledge. And, and I think that there lies the problem that there's just so much confusion and scaremongering and it's really hard to make that uh, decision and to kind of block out the noise. And I think what we always say is that it's so important to make a joint informed decision with a healthcare provider who is knowledgeable and actually knows what they're talking about and tells you these benefits versus risks. I mean, we've had women come to us who are suicidal, and I'm not saying that lightly, who literally 
we don't want to be here anymore because their symptoms are so bad. And the reason they're not on hormone replacement therapy is they've been told the risk of breast cancer is higher. And I know you say this and we will say the same to them now. Well, the risk of, if the risk of suicide, sadly, uh, you know, I shouldn't laugh is 99% and the risk of breast cancer is 5%, you know, which risk would you you take? And I think every day we, we weigh up the benefits and risks of everything, whether it's driving a car or getting on a plane or, or, or crossing a road. So uh, I think, you know, when, when women are trying to make these very difficult decisions, sometimes it's really important that they do have all these facts. Um, look, the, the, the one other um, really horrible side effect of, of breast cancer treatment um, and also menopause is, is vaginal dryness and vaginal atrophy, which can cause, you know, UTIs and it can cause, you know, really um, affect uh, relationships between partners. Um, now, there is plenty of evidence that um, vaginal estrogen is safe. Um, and was that something that you would always recommend to your patients? And, you know, would you advise that to anyone who's listening? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, I'll tell you, <laughs> one of my better innovations was to train up clinical nurse specialists to work alongside me. Uh, the reason I'm mentioning them now, some of these problems you just described, women were embarrassed to discuss with men. And it was vice versa. Men were embarrassed to discuss this with the women. So the way I got around this was uh, to train up clinical nurse specialists. And all my patients uh, got to chat to the clinical nurse specialist. Um, and these kind of problems were came back to me. Now, I must emphasize, it wasn't just me. Uh, now, all breast clinics have clinical nurse specialists who can handle these very sensitive topics that women um, don't like uh, discussing with men. And I can understand that it's just uh, being yeah. sensitive, that's all. Yeah, well, look, we, look the, we could go into so much detail here and we, we don't have enough time, but um, let, let's look to the future of breast cancer research and treatments. Um, are you, what are you sort of most optimistic about right now in the field of breast cancer research, women's health research, and where do you hope things will go in the next sort of 5, 10, 20 years for, for the future of your granddaughter and your daughter? Well, uh, top of my list is dementia. That's shocks. Uh, you think, what's that got to do with breast cancer? Uh, it's, it's HRT, which women are frightened of because it may cause breast cancer, we now know will reduce the risk of dementia. Dementia is the commonest cause of death for women now. So my initial concern is that we... Uh, make breakthroughs in reducing mortality from uh, dementia. Now, I phrase the question, the answer intentionally, mischievously, for the reason is you cannot and must not consider breast cancer in isolation. It cannot be managed properly in isolation. It's the totality of women's health that's important, not single issue fanaticism. And what upsets me is some of the younger generation are brilliant. They know the complete molecular shape and the, the molecular interventions in the nucleus and in the cytoplasm. Um, but <laughs> They forget that they the totality of the woman's health. So if I, my takeaway message is uh, breast cancer, the risk of breast cancer is one component in the totality of women's health. And the totality of women's health involves avoiding dementia, avoiding coronary artery disease, avoiding strokes, avoiding uh, osteoporosis, and reducing the risk of breast cancer. 
And I think it's good that you you mentioned that um, there aren't um, sort of definitive studies yet, but it's obviously in the pipeline about whether um, it, it prevents dementia, but there's lots of um, information out there. And in fact, um, in our next podcast episode, I do talk to a, a, a neurologist um, about the latest evidence on dementia. Um, but these are really important conversations to consider that the, you know, hormone replacement therapy, there are masses of benefits from reducing, as you said, cardiovascular disease um, and keeping blood pressure low and re reducing the risk of things like strokes um, and, and osteoporosis, which actually is one of the biggest killer of women as well. So look, we, we've covered a lot here, but um, on a more personal note, you're 85 now and um, people will find that pretty astounding that you still have all your marbles. But um, let, very quickly before I let you go, you, you've written a book called The History and Mystery of Breast Cancer, which I um, urge uh, people to read. We'll put the details of where they can uh, find it in the show notes because that will go into a lot more detail. Um, and um, if if you just Google Professor Michael Baum, you will be able to find um, other um, books and, and articles, published articles that he's written. So, uh, Professor Baum, Dad, thank you so much, um, not just for all this amazing information, but uh, teaching me as well. Hopefully I can carry on the baton a little bit and make you proud. Um, and for anyone that's listening, if you're concerned about anything we've uh, chatted about or confused, um, please do obviously uh, check with your own healthcare professional for any personalised advice. So thanks everyone for listening and be well. Thanks so much for listening to the Latty Lounge podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, it would mean a lot if you could subscribe wherever you're listening so you don't miss an episode. And finally, before I go, I just wanted to remind you to check out the episode show notes for all our extra resources. You'll find links in there for our free Facebook group and our free symptom checker, so you can track your own symptoms against a list of the 34 most common symptoms of perimenopause and menopause. See our show notes for more. This podcast was sponsored by Silk Natural Lubricant and produced by Emily Crosby Media. <laughs>